thank you. Thank you very much. I was told to introduce myself. So uh, Natalia Alexion is an uh, associate professor of modern Jewish history at Torah College Graduate School of Jewish Studies. No. Uh, and this uh, um, project is part of a book in the making on uh, daily life in hiding uh, in Eastern Galicia. Um, and there is interestingly a lot of parallels and continuities with uh, the previous lecture. So I think we are really happily positioned here. Um, and thank you uh, for including me in that busy schedule. And thank you for you to, to make the impossible choice between the three fantastic menus in uh, three rooms. So, um, in his memoir of hiding and survival in Eastern Galicia, Baruch Milch, um, a graduate of the medical college in Prague, describes a chilli chilling scene he encounters on the so-called Black Friday in the fall of 1942, following a sudden arrival in Tuste, and I'll stick to Polish geographic terms, although all those Eastern Galician uh, towns and cities now in Ukraine have their Ukrainian uh, perils. Um, Gestapo men who had demanded alcohol from the Judenrat and proceeded to shoot Jews at random. Milch rushed into uh, a house where, as he writes, more than 20 Jews had been killed, dragged from their hideouts before they had a chance to conceal themselves. A woman I knew, aged 22, uh, was so badly torn by bullets that I barely recognized her. She was still alive and in agony. The next morning, I gave her a huge dose of morphine so that she would not suffer as she died of blood poisoning. It was not easy to be a Jewish doctor in times like this. Milch's account, written immediately after his liberation, as well as many other Jewish doctors' testimonies, diaries, memoirs, and witness statements for court um, proceedings in Poland and Germany, give us an intimate insight into the experiences of Jewish physicians during the Nazi occupation. This paper is an attempt in 18 minutes to sketch a biographical group study of Jewish physicians in Eastern Galicia, men and women who had received their medical training in Poland, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, and in France, uh, by discussing the limits of their immunity vis-a-vis -vis German authorities and their local populations, as well as the role of informal networks during the Holocaust. Raoul Harmelin, who was born in 1924, was a son of a Jewish physician, uh, Elias Harmelin, in uh, Borysław. And talking about his hometown in an oral interview, he states, generally the people were living together in peace and harmony, which was also the result of the fact that Borysław, his hometown, had previously belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there was reasonable freedom of all nations there. Part of that somewhat idealized picture of uh, interethnic, happy interethnic rea relations in the interwar period is the role of Jewish doctors. And Miriam talked yesterday about the networks, of unique networks of Jewish healthcare institutions in uh, in Poland that then played a role in the ghettos. But I think that Eastern Galicia before the, because of Austro-Hungarian heritage was a little bit different and there were actually Jews who were still uh, occupying positions such as municipal doctors uh, that wouldn't be possible in other parts of the second uh, Polish Republic. But the numbers are high just like we heard already. Uh, before, in 1927, Jews constituted more than half of all physicians practicing medicine in uh, Eastern Galicia, but in rural areas, the numbers were much higher because 
Christian doctors were interested in staying in large cities and Jewish doctors were uh, seeking employment and going to smaller towns. Um, although many, uh, many Jewish doctors worked in Jewish physicians, in Jewish hospitals, provincial, in provincial, provincial towns, they were among few available doctors and treated numerous Christian, Polish and Ukrainian patients. Some were not only well respected, but also much needed due to their skills developing close relationships with local Polish and Ukrainian populations. During the German occupation, this is my main statement, during the German occupation, these contacts came to play a critical role, providing opportunities to identify rescuers among former non-Jewish patients. Indeed, mapping these networks, we see that physicians occupied a unique place in the social landscape of the region and their status proved essential in their survival from the summer of 1941 after the German attack on the Soviet Union, previously this area was under the Soviet occupation, until the liberation of Eastern Galicia in the summer of 1944. So, uh, four points I want to make, point number one, proving indispensable. The scarcity of non-Jewish doctors in provincial towns in Eastern Galicia forced the German administration to allow a degree of flexibility with their racial policies and kept Jewish doctors treating not only fellow Jews in ghettos and camps, but also local non-Jewish populations, as well as members, members of uh, German authorities and their families. For example, in Tuste, all five physicians living in the town in 1941 were Jews. Milch, whom I mentioned before, his brother-in-law, Dr. Jakub Weinloss, Dr. Meltzer, Dr. Grinberg, and Dr. Averman. Milch writes, writes in his memoir, since the new mayor's family were my patients, the Ukrainian authorities named me the new municipal doctor. The appointment and the fact that I wore a red and not blue Star of David on my sleeve gave me a certain amount of immunity from harassment and relative freedom of movement. My work brought me into contact with key Ukrainians and German killers, and he names some people. In the spring of 1942, Leon and Mina Deutsch, who both received their medical training at the German University in Prague, this is not a setup for Anna's talk, moved from the town of Mielnica to a small village, Dwiniaczka, after Leon had bribed the chief physician of the province. Instead of moving to the ghetto of Borstów, they received the permission to work in a large village where typhus and typhoid fever reigned. Mina notes in her memoir, patients started to come to us almost immediately since there had been no doctors, no other doctors in the village. After a few weeks, the mayors of each of the 17 villages had received a supply of vaccines against typhoid fever and had sent a horse and buggy for us to administer them. We were immediately inoculating thousands of people, I think she exaggerates with numbers, thousands of people day in and day out. We worked hard, traveling between villages, but felt relatively at peace. Patients paid for our visits with a lot of lo loaf of bread, some flour and potatoes. We were never hungry. I'll come back to the question of food. This prolonged lease on practicing their profession seems to have been limited to men. Even in a case of married couples, both with medical degrees, only men continued really to practice medicine under the German occupation in 41-42. While Mina presents the practice as shared with her husband, it seems that it was he who went on calls and was consulted by patients. Um, Possibly German officials and local peasants trusted more male Jewish physicians, but this is just me um, thinking aloud. Um, but in the memoir, in her memoir specifically, she talks afterwards how her husband was uh, well known and recognized in the area because he was a doctor, so therefore she was out, she was well known, so clearly he was the practicing physician. The second point, 
too visible to hide. In spite of, or possibly because of their unique status in local communities in Eastern Galicia, Jewish physicians were exposed to dangerous members of the local elite. They were singled out during the initial roundups in the first weeks of the German occupation, when members of the Jewish intelligentsia were ordered to report themselves to the German authorities and were subsequently tortured and murdered. And there are many reports and scenes in which it's the lawyers and physicians that are being um, assembled and killed. As such, those who did not get killed immediately, they were also repeatedly pressured to join the Judenrat and to play a formal role during selections. The men that some of them, and Ludwig Landau in Zbarasz, the father of Ida Fink, describes exactly how he tried to avoid being part of selections and being part of Judenrat, he managed to evade. While perceived as useful and possibly even temporarily indispensable, prominent Jewish male physicians were also known and therefore extremely visible, becoming an easy prey to, for those non-Jewish colleague, colleagues driven by greed and personal vendettas. The German occupation have given local non-Jewish physicians unprecedented professional opportunities. Milch describes the fate of his Jewish colleague, Dr. Meltzer, who had been the head of a local hospital. As soon as a sole new Ukrainian doctor arrived in Tuste, he replaced Milch as the municipal doctor. The Jewish doctors, writes uh, Milch, tried to keep him busy and to transfer their, Jewish, their uh, Christian patients to this Ukrainian doctor so that, he would not ha so that he would have his hands full, but to no avail. The Ukrainian doctor, coveting Dr. Meltzer's beautiful home, maneuvered the Ukrainian police into arresting him and his family at the behest of the Charkov Gestapo. Several days later, one of my patients, a Ukrainian policeman who suffered from syphilis, came to see me and informed me that they had transferred Dr. Meltzer, his wife and his two daughters by train to Chortkov uh, and he, he shot them the same day in a forest. The newly minted Ukrainian doctor and Milch goes on to say how nobody wanted to go to see him, no a peasant wanted to see him because he was not trusted, uh, gradually removed all Jewish competition in the town um, forbidding uh, from Jewish doctors to make uh, house calls, then forbidding pharmacy to uh, recognize the prescriptions, and so on and so forth. Milch uh, practice became limited to Jewish patients in a private practice and in a Judenrat clini clinic, where he treated particularly severe cases of infectious diseases, such as typhus and dysentery, which was very common. Um, and I will not have time to go into it, but that relationship with Jewish patients also involves increasingly um, dispensing sleeping pills to children when people go into hiding during roundups, and then gradually um, also having access uh, or being approached for dispensing um, poison for people who wanted to commit uh, suicide. But I want to focus on the last issue, which is the relationship with non-Jewish patients. Indeed, Ukrainian and Polish patients played a direct role in survival, also by protecting their Jewish physicians in a wave of anti-Jewish violence and during the roundups. Dr. Juriusz Landau, a different Landau, not Ludwig Landau, survived the first pogrom near Borysław thanks to his former patient, Ivan Baran, whose life he once saved. He was a Ukrainian, writes Landau. He took me to the hospital and put, and put a guard by me with an order not to touch me and not to let anybody touch me. Landau had founded the hospital and was the only physician working there. He was not only well respected, but also much needed due to his skills and he was then kept for a while after the first wa wave of violence. In Zbarasz and its vicinity, Ludwig Landau, um, relied on a network of his former patients, basically hiding 
um, for some time uh, at former patients of his, while his two daughters received uh, fake iron papers uh, with the help of another former, pa former patient. So the whole uh, close family uh, really owed their life to this network. Um, with the conditions in the ghetto's worsening and the drastically limited access to food, physicians who were able to see non-Jewish patients had a lifeline for themselves and their families. In the winter of 1942, Leon Deutsch, whose wife I cited before, traveled a lot between villages since there were so many sick people. They paid very little, usually just, within, uh, just a loaf of bread on a small bag of potatoes, but it meant a lot to us. He also managed to get some kerosene for our lamp so that we were not left in the dark at night, as well as some wood for our stove to make warm meal and to heat the house. I mostly stayed at home with Eva. They had the two-year-old daughter with them since it was so cold. So payment in kind saved the couple and their tod toddler daughter, and I think that it played a crucial role uh, throughout that transition between the... I'm well aware. Um, in the spring of 1943, um, the ghettos are, the remaining ghettos are liquidated and people are seeking places to hide, not temporary just during roundups, but uh, to hide for a longer time. And this is where patients become the essential address to go to. They might know also somebody who would be willing to hide their former physicians. But one case that I want to share in particular with you, again, involves this physician um, couple, Mina and Leon Deutsch, and they became, um, they just, they were not only hidden by a former patient, but they were hidden on a provision that Leon would continue the treatment of, um, of their, the family that was hiding them. So uh, she describes a moment when they find out, when they realize that the last remaining Jews in the area are being murdered. We walked through the fields into the next village where we knew a wealthy farmer by the name of Kukuruza. His son was sick with tuberculosis of the bones and he had been treated by Leon for some time. The treatment at that time consisted of calcium in injections and Leon traveled frequently to give, them to, uh, to give them to him. He knew that Kukuruza would try to keep us close so that Leon could continue to treat his son, saving them from traveling an entire day by horse and buggy to see another doctor in town. He would also have to pay for those visits properly, not just with a loaf of bread or a few eggs, as he did with my husband. Kukuriza, however, was afraid to let us stay with him, just as we were afraid to do so for fear that people in the village would recognize us. In the end, Kukuriza sets, us, sets them up with a peasant who keeps them, brings the doctor occasionally to his house. Uh, the injections are... Um, admitted, and the family of three survives. Aside for relationships with Christian patients, there is a sub-story to the attractiveness of Jewish physicians at the time of hiding, relative attractiveness, which is that even in cases in which, even in cases in which a small group of relatives would hide together, they were willing to take a physician in, uh, uh, even though it was not necessarily their relative, because they were perceived as practical members of the hiding community. Um, that usefulness continues after the liberation, and there are stories of uh, survivors emerging from their hiding places in the summer of 1944, and immediately going back to official practice now with peasants, uh, and with local populations saying, you know, we're so glad you made it, we've missed you, we didn't have a doctor. So that unique situation in Eastern Galicia, in rural areas, uh, ends up being essential for surviving strategies of physicians. Thank you. <laughs>